Right here, as we spoke to earlier, as I said to Mr. Abdallah Mustafa, Senior Research Officer at the uh, uh, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. On, so, so, so today we actually looked at instances where uh, some African countries, uh, you know, intervened or came to the rescue uh, on African, other African countries who find themselves in, in crisis, you know, disputes, political, civil and what have you. And the, the mode of operations and all of that. He spoke about a lots of issues, and we I'm going to be airing uh, some of the things that he talked about. So for starters, he, he made mention, uh, he run us through, uh, you know, what it entails on, on peacekeeping mission, and also issues of contributors based on regional blocks. What, how is it like? Uh, which country is supposed to do what, and and how is, is the protocol like? He talked about that as well, and uh, touched on issues of regional. Uh, you know, uh, actors, mediators, yes? So uh, where people have argued that it, it, it's not really the case. I mean, it shouldn't be the case where uh, countries of the same regional blocks intervene and then try to bring about solutions in, in these regions. So, I mean, we, br we broke it down in, in three parts. I'm going to be airing the first one, which he gave us uh, uh, what it entails on, on peacekeeping mission, uh, contributors to peacekeeping mission and based on regional blocks. And, of course, the regional actors, mediators, based on where they are. Talked about all of these. We'll be right back right after this tape. Listen. Walk us through, you know, the issue of peacekeeping because we hear it every now and then. But what does it entail, generally? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Right. Now, when we talk of peacekeeping, we are talking about a situation where a particular country is in crisis or is facing conflict, either a conflict between uh, rebel groups and the government forces, and that uh, there is there is no semblance of peace and stability. Now, uh, in, in such situations, uh, the country itself can request for uh, organizations like ECOWAS, African Union, or United Nations to intervene. Okay. But again, when even if the country does not request, and then the regional organization realizes that. What is going on in that particular country mm. undermines peace and security because we have all signed a protocol to collectively ensure peace and security across a particular region or a, a particular continent. That regional organization in question will have to intervene to ensure peace and security in that country because the United Nations, after the Second, after the Second World War, Mm. When there was a egregious uh, violations of human rights and all those things, the United Nations, when it was set up, it said, we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from another scourge of war. Okay. And so it is the responsibility of the United Nations to ensure peace and stability in all countries. But again, because the United Nations is far away from certain countries, okay. it empowers regional organizations like ECOWAS, like African Union, to intervene in situations where they, they realize that there is danger for citizens and for the general peace and stability of those countries. And so over the years, we have seen the United Nations as a regional body itself intervening in so many countries. But again, also regional organizations like OCOWAS, okay. African Union, also have been intervening in certain countries. If mm -hmm. you take the example of OCOWAS, it intervened in Liberia. Okay. It intervened in Sierra Leone when they were in conflict. Again, ECOWAS also intervened in a number of countries like Cote d'Ivoire and the rest. UN has also intervened in Rwanda. It has intervened in Congo DRC. It has intervened in, in a lot of countries like Cote d'Ivoire and a host of others. So basically, they do this intervention precisely to, to be able to maintain peace okay. and to restore peace into those countries. Right. Okay, thank you very much. So, so generally, it's based on request or the need to go in to resolve issues if, if it's actually escalating and would have a, uh, an inverse effect on, you know, the other neighboring countries around those regional blocks, yes? Yeah, yeah, that is the case. Great. Let, let's also talk about, you know, uh, deployment of troopers. Talk about contributions by various uh, countries around, you know, blocks and all of that. Uh, an example is what happened in Mali. 
a couple yeah. of months back. So there was there's this issue of ECOWAS promising some more than 3,000 troopers to, to Mali. But unfortunately, that, that wasn't forthcoming. So which forced, uh, you know, Mali seeking help from France. So what are we looking at? Is it that we don't have a lay down protocol on which country contributes what in terms of because we know the constraints when it comes to logistics, uh, you know, weapons, artilleries and what have you. Why so? Yeah, you realize that uh, every conflict situation is unique in, 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 in its own uh, evolution. And in terms of the challenges that uh, every, every uh, conflict or conflict situation faces. Okay. And so you realize that if you take the example of Sierra Leone, Liberia, those unique cases differ from the situation in Mali and maybe any other other countries like DRC. Okay. And so uh, ECOWAS was able to intervene in Liberia, for example, because the the situation itself allowed ECOWAS to be able to intervene. But in the case of Mali, you know what is happening in Mali is more like uh, terrorist activities. Okay. And it's a more or less like asymmetrical kind of warfare. And therefore, ECOWAS initially pledged to engage in mediation to resolve the issue. Right. But in terms of uh, actual peacekeeping deplo deployment, ECOWAS lacked the capacity at the time. Okay. So they initially started mediation effort, but they realized that uh, the rebels, the, those who were engaged in those extremist activities, were moving from the northern part of the country towards the capital. Right. And therefore, Eddie Kowal didn't have the capacity at the time to be able to respond to those threats. Mm. And that is how come uh, the, the Amari to Mali Ture then, and then the, the people of Mali requested mm. that France will have the robust force to be able to drive away the extremist groups. But other than that, Ekowaz made they had an intention okay. to intervene. Mm. They started even with mediation effort. Right. But they realized that no, they don't have the they didn't have the logistics, they didn't have the, the, the military troops at the at, at, at that time. And mm -hmm. therefore there was the need to request for a bigger country or a country that had the capacity okay. to be able to respond to the extremist situation. Let's also talk about contribution. Uh, which country so how is it done? Do we I believe we have a protocol for various uh you know contributors, say Nigeria brings more this, more, you know, trading facility, logistics from Ghana, this from Gambia, and what have you. Do we have, a, 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 I mean, a, a document or a procedure like that? Yeah, yeah. United Nations, you know, that is a major organization that actually ensures peace and stability, as I indicated earlier on. Right. But again, there are instances where it was also allows by Chapter 6, sorry, Chapter 8, of the United Nations Charter allows regional organizations like African Union and ECOWAS. Okay. And so, just of them that not, you United Nations has certain principles where they, they say they will not intervene in a country where there is no peace to keep. Mm -hmm. What that means is that if there is no peace agreement between the fighting forces, okay, the UN often doesn't want to intervene because they have intervened in situations where they are they are too have been actually been killed and that is precisely because there was no peace agreement between the forces and so when they when you go in there to to keep peace sometimes the the, the fighting forces can, can 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 kill a lot of you because they haven't reached an agreement okay. that happened in somalia sometimes in 1993 in which a lot of u.s soldiers died and so u.n says we will not intervene when there is no peace to keep okay. so in such instances hmm. regional organization will intervene because the thing is happening in our backyard. We will not look on to see our people dying. Okay. And so every country has a, a troop okay. that it often contributes, but that also depends upon domestic challenges. If you have domestic challenges where, for instance, you are organizing an election, mm -hmm. and you realize that my troops, if I send them outside, they will, they it will also undermine issue, yeah. my domestic security. peace and security. Mm. In that instance, you realize that countries will not be able to they will not provide risk more troops. Mm, mm. Uh, and so, there's, so you see some variations in terms of contribution that has some relationship with the domestic challenges okay. that every country is facing at any given time. Mm. But there are certain countries that are that have that are known as major contributors of peacekeeping. Ghana is one of them. Okay. If you come to West Africa, you can talk of Ghana, you can talk of Nigeria, okay. you can talk of Senegal. 
Okay. These are some of the key ca contributing countries. And then since 1960, Ghana has been co consistently contributing troops okay. to all peacekeeping missions. And right. so there are certain countries that have that capacity over the period of time. Okay. And some other countries also do not have the capacity because their contingents, the number of contingents that they have is mm. limited. Okay. And so, so in terms of contribution, it is based on international demand, but okay. also looking at it in terms of the domestic challenges okay. in, that, in, that one has. In yeah. our country. That, I love that's, Africa that's Global Radio. To know. Okay, that was the first part uh, that I will be airing by uh, Mr. Mustafa Abdullah, a senior research officer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Center here in Abbey's Ghana. Touched on a number of issues, started with, uh, you know, the peacekeeping mission itself, looked at um, contributions on regional blocks and what have you. And I think he made some interesting points right there. Let me start with my colleague, Hafiz. Hafiz, how are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, another session again with uh, Mr. Abdullah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, yeah. man seems to know his bits at the tip of his fingers, eh? No, he knows. Right. Yeah, I mean, interesting questions you asked him. Mm. I mean, he started by giving us a context to what exactly we knew as peacekeeping, what it, what it entails. Absolutely. So mm. he gave us a little bit of context uh, to that, to start off the conversation. Okay. And I think it, that clarity was good because, yeah. I mean, uh, a layman's idea or most Abs people's idea yeah. of what peacekeeping is, is mm. this is actually seeing... Uh, you know, uh, soldiers being deployed, soldiers deployed, or they go somewhere and, and then they come back and yeah. they're making big bucks. So yeah, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So mm. he, it was a good thing he actually gave a context to I'm what still. exactly peacekeeping mm. entails. Then he moves on to talk about, you know, uh, I think you pushed him a bit into talking about the Mali situation. I all yeah, he gave, uh, you know, Certain context, context to yes, mm. yes, and uh, talking about, uh, you know, how conflicts differ in their makeup because no two conflicts are the same. Are the same. Talking about the Liberia, Sierra Leone, and you know the Mali situation, and you realize the the makeup of all these uh, situations that we had, right. uh, these packets of violence and everything situations we had over the continent are not the same. Mm. So the approach is different. Okay. So he went on to you know give us uh, try to understand, make us understand what ECOWAS did in terms of mediation efforts, right. which I found very interesting, because I mean they tried negotiating with terrorists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm sure you are even familiar with it. There's this policy of America where... No, we don't, we don't, we don't they negotiate. Don't negotiate no, 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 no. With, do you think it's something that we should adopt? You know? It depends on what you have and what you're stepping on. I don't think a blind man would want to stone you without no, stepping on No, we are here stone. trying to negotiate with terrorists and but I'm saying well, I, it got out of hand. I think it's, it's, the, it's, it's the way ni America has placed itself okay. in, in the world and how people see America to be superpowers. I mean... You know, and, and, and I think that has really helped America to a larger extent because they see you as, you, you're not the threat in as much as they know that you're the threat, but they, I don't know if it's kind of like a way of anyway, but maneuvering see, through just to get to you, but it has really helped. I don't because know for me, I think, you know, just negotiating or trying to mediate mm. like what ECOWAS was, was trying to do, legitimizes terrorism. And uh, you know, makes the emboldens them if you yeah. Want. Yes, we have our rights. Yes, exactly. Can have a it say. Them, okay, well, let's just get up and start capturing people. Mm. Yeah, it will force them to negotiate, and I think uh, that's problematic for me. Mm. But even speaking of America, I mean, if we are talking about negotiations, it's not all the time that they don't negotiate. I mean, mm. I think the Obama administration was in hot waters for uh, releasing, I think, swapping five uh, detainees at Guantanamo, uh, Guantanamo Bay for. Uh -huh. Uh, one army sergeant. The I same ones that came Bowie. to Ghana? No. Oh, there are five. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, five. right. That was somewhere in 2014. Mm. So, in some contexts, they do negotiate. So, mm. that is not entirely true that they don't negotiate. Mm. But uh, moving on to the other bits uh, of the conversation where he talks about the UN and what exactly did okay. they do. And mm. yes, just to provide a little bit of meat to what he said, mm. I think uh, he's saying that. You know what the UN does is uh, they won't go into a place there is no agreement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, or where there is no peace. Or where there is nothing where there's to. No yeah. Yeah. So mm. what essentially he's saying mm. is that the UN only goes in there when there's some sort of uh, you know a plan in place. Okay. okay. So what they do is they they provide complementary support rather than a supplementary one. Mm. Yes. So your regional actors will provide a muscle. They'll start to quell the situation, mm -hmm. and they come in to do the humanitarian stuff. Right. In the post conflicts reconstruction that's what they do mm. yes because at the end of the day well un is not just supposed to operate in your country, in your country they are supposed yeah. to be all over mm -hmm. so what it happens is what happens is that they they, they get to you know cover more ground okay. and act quicker mm. so that's the whole idea behind the way they do things mm. so they don't go in their guns blazing and yeah. everything so 
they adopt a more laid back approach so to they just walk to, into to, a, to, to a, the things co- they do. a conflict zone and yes. start you know yes. and, mediating and, 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 and the, all. the other parts where you talked about contributions mm. in terms of troops and yeah. everything yeah yes and uh, if you look at it i think largely yeah. i think you made mention of how you know sometimes when it's difficult for you know, some people don't exactly want certain actors from out of out of the original blocks intervening in yeah. certain matters. Mm. And usually, when when that example comes up, a lot of people bring up the situation of Nigeria in 1997, the way they behaved with ECOMOG, mm-hmm. when they deployed some, I think, uh, 900 soldiers. Are they the largest, con- yes. largest, you know, or they're the leading and con- yes. largest contributors well, to ECOMOG? Well, we're talking about ECOWAS, well. so yeah, Ghana, def- Nigeria. Definitely. So, mm. and I think in, in the conflict in 1997 with mm-hmm. Sierra Leone, what happened was that Nigerian, the, uh, Nigeria d- deployed about 900 troops through ECOMOG. 900,000 or 900? 900. Okay. Yes. Added to, you know, uh, the ECOMO contingent. Okay. In there. Yes, yes. So when they went in there, now the whole idea was that they were supposed to get authorization first from ECOWAS before they stepped in there. Okay. They didn't. Hmm. They were in there until about three months later they got the authorization. Whoa. So it got a lot of... That's the fine protocol, I believe. Exactly, because mm. you're supposed to act within certain parameters, certain mm-hmm. protocols, like yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah. So if you go doing stuff like that, what it means is that you have other, you know, smaller nations beginning to think, oh, well, it looks like Nigeria is starting something with this whole show leading echo mock exactly. thing. Yeah. It's like they want to dominate the sub region and everything. Yeah. So it got a lot of people worried with, right. with you know the way mm. they approach things. But of course we saw them eventually solve issues there yeah. with the help of Ghana and other countries. And all, anyway. all right, thank you. Let me hear uh, Epi's take on uh, our first part of the interview. Epi. I think on this part, I'm particularly concerned about what he spoke about. I mean, if there's not peace agreement between the two conflicting countries, okay, uh, the UN wouldn't want to send troops there because they've had an experience where they actually lost quite a number of uh, peace UN agreement soldiers between exi- conflicting countries. I yeah, don't so think people no, in conflicts would be in agreement. No, but if they haven't agreed on a setting term, if there's no peace, if they don't, the leaders don't sit, they don't send their troops in. Okay. So then I'm just wondering. It's like everybody's trying to save themselves in a mm. way that we wouldn't want to send people in and then you just slaughter them and then in the end we didn't actually even attain what we actually went there for okay so then i feel it's important mm. that as much as we try to have all these external organizations coming in it still boils down to the question that can we really solve our own problems okay because who would these two conflicting parties actually listen to okay yes mm. and it also brings about the case where i've seen this issue where it's like two Enemies become friends Mm -hmm. to just destroy a particular target after which they go back to fighting each other again. So I feel it's important that, I mean, I'm glad the UN has such a policy so they don't risk the lives of, should I say, innocent Okay, all right. Yes, Mm. just so that two conflicting parties can just slaughter them and then go about killing themselves. But Mm. I'm happy there's an intervention in everything that happens here. Mm. Okay, thank you, Epi. Uh, The show is Africa Daily on Africa Global Radio. Let's hear the second part of the uh, interview. Uh, He talked about regional, you know, actors and what have you, as well as looked at um, issues of, uh, you know, assault leveled against these peacekeeping troopers and what have you in different countries. So we'll take that and we'll we'll be right back. Listen up. Let's also talk about um, regionalizing people peace operations. So, for instance, regional actors, let's go to, let's say, Northern Africa, where some have actually argued that, you know, an intervention by regional actors is actually not the way to go because of issues of, you know, national interest. Let's say uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, having, you know, maybe there's, a, there's an issue there where Egypt would have to come to the rescue or intervene. So some have argued that there's, there's, there may be some bias because they are in the same region. So because of national interest, People have argued that that is not the best way to go, but rather they would seek for an international body to act uh, and and try to resolve, you know, the case there. W- what is your take on that? Yeah, that is uh, true to some extent. Uh, in terms of you know, within every region, you have a lot of governments or president having certain alliances with their, their neighbors. Okay. And some of, some of them may have tensions with their neighbors. If you take West African sub region, for instance. Realize that when Atamos was in power, uh, Atamos, for instance, appeared to have some ideological inclination towards the Babu government. Okay. And again, Watara is also seen, current, the current president for Watara is seen to have some ideological leaning with the MPP government. Right. Now, so all these policies exist. 
And therefore, when, for instance, uh, Cote d'Ivoire was in crisis somewhere in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, and then the ECOWAS was calling for countries to contribute to. Mm. Atambo said in the Akan language, you fear them. Mm. Which means he, uh, mind Ghana your was business. not ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, mind your business. Ghana was not, was not willing or was not ready to actually intervene. Right. And some people interpreted it to mean that, yes, because he has some ideological leaning with Bago, he doesn't want to intervene to go and then crash on, yeah. on, on his people. You right. understand? And so mm -hmm. there have been a number of instances where because of these alliances, I think the right thing is that the UN, which is far away from 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 a, a, a area where there is conflict, would have to intervene. Okay. But the, as I indicated earlier, UN says it will not intervene in situations where there is no, no peace. peace. Yeah. So in so in spite of all these policies that actually uh, brings us some certain raises and a number of questions within a particular region. Okay. I think. The initial thing is that let's intervene to stabilize the situation in spite of all the politics and all the alliances that exist. Right. Uh, yeah, to try and stabilize the situation, then we can withdraw mm. and allow the UN to take over. Okay. But otherwise, if you take the example of Rwanda, in which I believe there was a lack of star in terms of responses, mm. and then we realized that a lot of people died within 100 days, close to like 1 million people. And so regional organization thought, in spite of all the policies that we have, okay. in, in, part, in spite of the alliances that we have with other governments, we actually need to intervene as a first step, okay. stabilize the situation, reduce casualties, and then we will then allow the UN to intervene. So the politics exists, but again, if you also look at the situation, you know, in order not to allow a lot of people to die, yeah. I think... Yeah, we can we can intervene in such situations and then allow the UN to come in later. Later on, to continue to okay. sustain the peace. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that one. Now, now let's go to another uh, a bit sensitive issue, which has to do with you know sexual assault allegations against you know peacekeeping troopers by specifically women in these countries that they go into to resolve issues because there are some articles you know leveled against peacekeeping troopers on, on sexual assault on women and this and that and, and all of that uh, how true is is this situation yeah to a very large extent this is true because there have been a number of reports that has inducted a number of countries that have engaged in sexual exploitation and abuse mm. uh, two of my colleagues have undertaken a field work in Congo DRC about two or three years ago, okay. and they came out with a lot of information concerning these kind of abuses. The UN has recognized that that, that happens, okay. and therefore whenever it happens, there is a sanction, a state sanction on those who have engaged in all those kind of activities to the extent that sometimes you will not be allowed to participate in peacekeeping again. As a nation? At the, yes, in the, in, the, in the UN. Right. And so because you'll be indicted, your country will be denigrated in terms of its human rights records. Okay. And so countries are increasingly becoming careful. But mm. again, you see, it's a human nature mm. where people have individual ideas and the way they respond to things. And so some people, when they stay for long within a peacekeeping theater mm. and they do not get to satisfy those desires, right. sometimes they, 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 they engage they in those things. And precisely also because of the the difficulties within the environment, mm. and sometimes so they happen, and that is why uh, now when the UN uh, picks people to go in peacekeeping, okay. they want them to come back home after six months, right, so right. that they can rotate and bring in new people, okay, so that all those difficulties that they face, and mm. then leading them to engage in all those things can be reduced, okay, even though it may not be eliminated completely because people have their own individual behavior and. Okay susceptible to such things. Right. But again, you can continue to actually put in place measures and okay. policies right. to, to try and reduce the, the incidence of these things. Great. I Great love Africa that. Global Radio. All right, another one uh, by Mr. Mustafa Abdallah looking at uh, regional actors, mediators based on the, the various regions where they are located and uh, also talked about sexual assault. Uh, I mean, leveled against, you know, these peacekeeping Soldiers, you know, they're supposed to go and solve issues and 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 help people and all of that. But unfortunately, here yeah, uh, cases of sexual assault and everything. Let me start with half is on that. How is your take? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's rather unfortunate mm. when you have you know troops going to a place to you know uh, to be the you know 
the in between mm -hmm. uh, between warring factions uh, they leave the place and you tend to hear get to hear stories that mm. touch uh, such as you know issues of sexual exploitation right but uh, it, it's one is one situation more like an albatross around the neck of the UN for a while now. Mm. I mean, it's uh, accusations of sexual ex uh, exploitation is one that has been around since 1992. To provide mm. more context to right. what you're saying, since 1992. I mean, in uh, these are these were formal allegations that began then, and in the wars again uh, in Cambodia, mm. then it just spiraled out of control for some reason. Then there was the Bosnia and Herzegovina war. Then mm. it moved on to DR Congo, then East Timor, all over the place. So by 2006, I think we are talking about some official cases of some about 357 cases of sexual assault. Wow. Yes, uh, allegations leveled against uh, UN troops from uh, allegations of rape to, you know, requests for sexual favors after delivering food items and everything. Mm. So these were all issues that came up. Now, I think uh, uh, going further, he gave how, you know, the UN yeah, have the tried to, and all. Yes, try mm. to address the issues by, yeah. you know, rota uh, rotating them uh, every six, six months, months period. Yeah, period. Yes, right. which is commendable. Mm. But, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, scholars and, you know, stakeholders in, the, in, in peace and security matters have uh, for some time, you know, been head flirting with the idea of, you know, having women more involved in peacekeeping operations. Okay, okay. Now, their thinking is that uh, when they are, you know, what, w whenever they are with a platoon, mm -hmm. what it means is that they have a natural inclination to stop or to rein in their male colleagues when they decide to go off the rails. Right. And, I, I mean, it's a myth, if you ask me. Is it? It, it is. Well, it anyway, is. It conversation for another <laughs> so time. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Let me let me take uh, Mami's. Uh, Mami, let me hear yours uh, before I get to Epi. Epi, uh, Mami? Bye. Mm-hmm. So, um, Mr. Mustafa spoke about how some nations were decline in stepping in. Yeah, in within the same... Troops, in the same region, mm. sending troops to help conflict nations mm. just because of some relationship. Yeah, they have. I right. think... In as much as that is understandable, mm. I feel like it's not it's not a good it's not a good decision in the sense that mm. let's say you're saying me and Cote d'Ivoire are cool because mm. maybe they give me water or maybe I get something from, from there. Them, right. So when there's a conflict, I won't step in because if I step in, and I, it's like it's like having two friends have a conflict, mm. and then you you decide to say someone would think oh she's she's supporting this. Mm. Or she's supporting that. So I believe, um, so you do that. You sit on the fence. That is called sitting on the fence. Right. Deciding not to speak on the matter mm. or to get involved. Mm. So you sit on the fence and let's say this whole nation goes to ruin. The mm. conflict ends up ruining the nation. Then what? Mm. Then where are you going to get those things you were getting from? Just right. because you decided not to step in. And then, um, and then speaking on, so I think that is a decision that most governments have to think twice about, mm -hmm. about sitting on the fence when it comes to dealing with nations in conflict. Okay. And then it can't, then, um, then I'll, I'll talk on the assault. The assault. Mm. I believe rotating is like these officers or these peace people who are supposed to keep peace mm. are not punished. Like the, the individuals are not, are not punished. Huh? Because mm. if, if you say that, I mean, we have people complaining of assault, so we are going to rotate them every six months, then it means the people who do the assault or who do the rape go scot-free. But the, 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 he's, he mentioned the sanctions, like not allowing your country to take part in any peacekeeping mission again. Exactly. So they reduce the numbers. The numbers, yeah. Are they punishing the individuals who commit but how those do you, acts? That, that's the thing. How do you identify you see, and, and these usually, ones? You see, the thing is, usually these stories come out when they are even long gone or seven into Yes, numbers. yes. So <laughs> at that time... That's when the yeah. damage has been done and everything. Mm. So... Because at the time, there, there are so many issues. Tensions are high. Tensions you know? are high. Yeah. So getting to you know investigate some of these matters. Identify a particular individual okay. and all But I think things. if that could be done, right. it would help. Because then you, if you're using one or two or three people as scapegoats, okay. then there's an example. Mm. It sets an example for those so for the next people that will come. Right. They know that if I go and I touch, I assault a woman or I rape somebody. This is the penalty. This is the penalty. Right. Okay, thank you, Mommy. Let me uh, quickly take uh, Epi's and then we can wrap it all up. Epi? Yeah, I think a better solution should be, I mean, arrived at when it comes to dealing with the people who actually do commit these assaults when they mm. go to these countries. Because I feel it's not, yes, you sanction the country and then 
uh, the time is delayed and all that, but I feel that something more should be done. Let's not forget it's rape you're talking about, mm. not just anything. And these people already have trouble going on in their countries. Exactly. And then you actually pull them through another traumatizing you're, you're experience. You're double-cutting them, eh? Where's the trust? And then it makes it difficult for... Uh, let's say the people in charge of these countries to okay. open themselves up to you when mm. you want to push something about peace to them because there's a fear that you even this come to your, cause more trouble yeah, than them. they already have. Mm. Yes. All right. Finally, let's take this quick one where he mentioned you know some some some, some time the period where we actually had more you know peace keep uh, keeping missions happening on the continent of Africa. We'll take that real quick so we can wrap up. So which year in Africa? that we really see more, you know, peacekeeping missions going on across all regional blocks. Can you pinpoint? Yes. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I will not be able to pinpoint exactly which year, but we have seen over the, from 1990s onwards. Mm. Yes. Uh, you know, we have had a period where we, we, we call it term as a Cold War period. Mm -hmm. uh, that is between, so after immediately after the Second World War up till 1989. Right. And so during those period, what we experienced were interstate wars. Okay. And they were minimal in terms of uh, the, uh, their frequency during that period because a superpower play uh, was there between Russia and then the Soviet Union. Mm. But uh, again, when the, there was a, the, the end of the Cold War in 1989, we began to see a lot of civil uh, wars. Okay. between government forces and the rebel forces. It mm. was no longer between states, again. And so from 1990s towards 2000, we began to see a lot of uh, conflict. You can talk of the conflict of Rwanda, you can talk of Burundi, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and then in 2000, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and, and a few others. Mm. So within that period, we saw a lot of countries going into conflict. And then we also saw uh, the proliferation of deployment of peacekeeping forces into these into these missions. Okay. okay. And so, if you also realize from 2000 up to 2010, right. Liberia was no longer, Liberia's conflict ended around 2003 and that of Sierra Leone as well. Okay. But we also had situations in Mali and mm. Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. And then we also have missions in this area. Okay. So, one can talk about between 1990 to 2000 as a period where we saw a lot of missions, mm. uh, UN peacekeepers being deployed into a number of countries. Right. So, but uh, now it has reduced in terms of the numbers as compared to the uh, between 1990 and mm. 2000. Now the number of peacekeeping has, has, reduced. has actually reduced. So, in, uh, we, yes. so we can relatively say that at least there's some level of peace around, you know, some regions in Africa as compared to, you know, previous times, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Because if you look at the 1990s, you can talk of Sierra Leone, you okay. can talk of Liberia, you can talk of Cote d'Ivoire. Mm. But now, within our West African sub-region, mm. where we have missions is in Mali. Mm. Effectively, even though there are some other political missions, mm -hmm. where we do, which is not in terms of the, uh, troop deployment, mm. but where we have active deployment in West Africa mm. is, in, is, in, is in Mali. No. I love Africa Global Radio. All right, thank you very much. And that, uh, he gave a context to, uh, you know, the, the, the periods where we really experienced more peace keep mission uh, on the continent of Africa. Hafez. Yes, very quickly. Um, mm. Yes, uh, it's interesting that he mentioned Liberia, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone in the 90s, mm. uh, 97 and all. Some were not born here. So. Right. But it's interesting he, he mentioned those uh, those places. Mm -hmm. I mean, in recent memory, I think, the one I can think of is, uh, you know, Senegal moving into Gambia when, yeah. you know, to defuse yeah. that situation mm -hmm. with Yaya Jame. Yeah, Yaya Jame, right, right. Yes, uh, so, mm. because if you're talking about military might in West Africa, you are mentioning Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal. Senegal, so, that's true. Uh, it was a good thing to see Senegal moving there to defuse that situation. Right. Uh, uh, in recent memory, uh, he still mentioned Mali, Mali uh, right. the operations of Al Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, mm -hmm. okay, in there, and uh, we saw five nations come together. together. Uh, mm. Even though it didn't prove yeah. enough to, to you know, diffuse that. It was an effort. I... There was still an effort, mm. so uh, mm. give them a B for an effort. All then right. lastly, I mean, we saw uh, recently, I think that was in April, mm. South Africa moving into Mozambique to quell yes. the situation there. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, mm. uh, I think uh, the Cabo Delgado mm -hmm. province mm -hmm. uh, in there with terrorist activities of Islamic exactly. State. So, exactly. I mean, mm. it's interesting to mm. see all these, mm. uh, you know, uh, movements in terms mm. of cooperation, in terms mm. of troops, deployment mm. of troops, and to the mission to, 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 to provide peace anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Hafiz. Finally, Epi, let's let's hear your take on then. 
I think we'll be able to solve more issues if we start standing together, together. with other African countries okay. and understanding. And half of the time, it's because as much as everybody is here to help, there's always that little bit of selfish agenda. Okay. As much as we're jumping in to help, there's something that we, we want in there. If we can actually do away with that and really go in because we're looking for the overall peace and right. looking to attain the end goal of gaining peace so there can be prosperity or development in the country is going to help. And people okay. will start opening up more to these other people. Okay, thank you. Let's hear Mami take uh, on that one. Okay, just a sec. Okay. I'll, I'll just say finally that we should be more united Okay. in passing than on paper. I mean, we talk about wanting a one African state mm -hmm. and then we go about our ways. I mean, I remember when this whole... And I remember when this whole SARS thing started and then Ghanaians were on the on the back of Nanado to say something, to say something, yeah, to say something. Yeah. And then he said something and then we all saw what happened. The guy, mind your business. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a subtle... <laughs> it's only the Ghana thing. It was, I mean, every nation to himself situation. Yeah, no, so, but, I mean, the response from, you know... <laughs> The, the the other the the other man you know it wasn't really you know it was like it, it, well it, like it was it was a subtle job yeah. actually like the the, o the other ma the other man's response wasn't that but I mean <laughs> anyway we should we should actually care about together. people start together um in pesting so in, in a real life and what's on paper and just say it amazing thank you very much guys and uh, trust me amazing uh, submissions and take right there from all of you so yeah whatever you have to say as well you can also share them with us on Facebook Africa Global Radio you can listen to the playback uh, on playback on africaglobalradio.com on demand.